Hello and welcome to a very special edition of the 5th Trooper and Notorious Scoundrels podcast. This is our pre-LVO show, that's the Las Vegas Open, and today I'm joined by David, aka Endless. Hey everybody. Kyle, aka Orchimedes. What's up? Mike, aka Dashes. Hey guys. And Evan, aka my co-host on the 5th Trooper. Hey, how's it going? And I am Jay Shalansky, and hello and welcome. How's everybody feeling? You guys ready for Vegas? I am very ready for Vegas. Super ready. You guys Uh, sound it. I'm feeling a little (laughs) deflated. (laughs) Extremely excited for Vegas. Uh. By very ready, what I really mean is I have one squad of stormtroopers completely painted, and I am not ready at all. Oh my god! Wow, <laughs> perfect. So, Spray and wash, man. Spray and wash. I mean, everything's primed for the most part. Uh, it, you know, it, yeah. yeah. Like I got paint on every model. I got no like, and I got no grays. But man, it's still like I've been pushing myself, and yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm not a not a careerist painter. I know some folks are like extremely good at painting because they've been doing war games forever. But someone like me who's kind of new, you know, not so much experience there, you know, doing what I can. <laughs> Going to make them look nice, hopefully. Yeah, not to make everybody sound bad, but my army's completely painted. Oh, I did see that. It. it looked good. Hey, looked thanks, good. man. I mean, it looked well, better if, than mine, for sure. At least, at least I'll look good when I go down in flames. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just oh. resigned to the fact that uh, I'm going to be painting with a plane with a partially painted army and adepticon is my new my new benchmark since lvo doesn't have a painting requirement well and i guess you know what though i would say this this is a good thing for our listeners i think that looking at some of this stuff like even if we look at adepticon they only have a three color requirement so if you're finding yourself short on time coming into these tournaments don't try to force yourself to be perfect you know, I think if we just try to get at least three colors on and make them look somewhat okay, I think it's going to be your best goal if you're running out low on time. Yeah, I, and I would, you know, as long as we're hitting that kind of chord, you know, like I haven't even taken my specialists out of the box yet. I've just been proxying. Um, and, I mean, it's there, there wasn't a long window to, you know, deal with that for the most part. So, um, I don't, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Just get your model up to like a, a halfway decent standard, um, and kind of go from there. Yeah. And I think, you know, us Imperial players probably have a little bit easier than David does. Cause God, I mean, the rebels, you got to paint like flesh and hair and all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, how's that? How's that feeling for you? Man? Oh, yeah. Like I've always I was actually kind of shocked at how many different colors I actually needed to get this army off the ground because I was sort of like, I mean, I guess I was being really ambitious with some of this. I'm like, OK, well, I mean, these guys are going to have this color hair. And oh, you know, these Z6s, they got like the power pack on the back. So I got to make them blue. <laughs> you know, so it's like I just introduced more and more levels of complexity into into the paint job and it just seemed like never ending for a little bit there but um i also made the mistake of painting all my squads the same scheme and i noticed there's some marvel players who are very smart very wise and actually painted each squad slightly different so they could keep more uh, easier visual track on the board and i um i didn't think about that until it was too late so <laughs> my solution is to put a uh, little notches on the bases or like you know you know, this one's squad number one because they got one square, and this one's squad number five because they got a V or something on the bottom, on the back of the base. But I mean, there's tons of different ways to do it. But you know, to your original point, uh, Jay, yeah, it, it's a, a lot more complicated than just um than just uh you know stormtroopers with white and the black micro pen and maybe some shoulder pad color. Uh, yeah, for sure. And I, I, I can see how that can be daunting for people, especially if you're part of any of the groups. 
and you know you got guys and and girls showing off their off their painted miniatures and you're just like oh for god's sakes i'm never gonna make it i might as well just phone it in on this one but uh so anyways yeah so i think for on this cast like i said it's we're the very special pre lvo uh so just so everybody out in podcast land is aware um myself david and mike are all playing uh kyle is going to be one of the judges and then evan is going to be watching from home (laughs) so so that's how it's going to be going thanks bud I'll be right in, man. <laughs> Subtle jabs. Subtle jabs. Boom, boom, boom. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I just, I want to back up in the show for like five minutes just because okay. it it stood out to me and I didn't want to interrupt you guys. Uh, you know, you said that it was easier for Imperials and it you just set the layup for Dave and he just didn't follow through. There was no salt whatsoever. And I'm... I've been, pun- I've been punished for hot takes in the past. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to follow that trend. All right. I just. I was. I, I was actually to thinking. <laughs> no, please, no. I was thinking before the show. I was like, oh, I'm gonna come on and you know make you know I'm gonna crack a bunch of jokes because you know it's practically a meme now that like Empire is easier. But um, you know, I just I'm just leaving all that behind. I think I'm just trying to get my mindset right for um <laughs> for the big day, and just trying to you know say look, I'm just gonna play the game in front of me. You know, whatever my feelings are. You know, <laughs> if you're gonna win the game. You got to do what's necessary. So no, just take a more fun approach. I think we should talk about this, not in a salt mine way, but I think I think this is a great segue into when you're going into a tournament on play style. And so, so here's something I saw just in Buffalo. So I played Chris Cook. He was playing this really great Rebels list. And it's the first time in Orc I haven't played you, so so I can't. You know, I don't can't say this about everybody, but it's the first time I've played someone that plays Rebels and I felt like they played them correctly. And what I mean by that is he played them reserved. He played them like almost a come to me type style versus a a more aggressive style. And he really utilized the dodge nimble. Um, and and I, I was very impressed by the way he was he was playing. Because uh, I think part of the problem, um, I think Rebels is a thinking man's army. And so I think you need to really be on top of your game when you're playing Rebels. And you got to utilize LOS and you got to utilize cover and your dodge. And you got to be very strategic when you're playing Rebels, where I think Imperials is kind of a run and gun army. Even though you still have to be strategic, I think overall there's a little bit more room for mistakes with with imperials i think that's true with regard to you know the core troops um like it's if if your storms get caught out in the open it's a little bit less punishing um but i don't know that that's necessarily true overall i mean boba fett is a difficult piece to use um i wouldn't begin to know what to do with palpatine um bikes are really difficult to play so i wouldn't like necessarily say that on a macro level that empire is easier um it's definitely Thank harder you. to. <laughs> it's definitely tougher to get your your uh, your core dudes killed. Um, you know, if you if you get a rebel trooper squad caught out of cover, uh, they're just gonna die because they depend really on those static defensive benefits. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say that like, you know, in general, one faction is is easier or harder than the other. It's just about play style. Um, I will say that I, my play style sounds very similar to Chris Cook's. Um, I tend to, you know, take shots of opportunity like the first few turns, but not do anything crazy or aggressive and just wait for an opening, you know, wait for my opponent to make a mistake or wait for an opening or, you know, where I can force pull something around a corner and delete an activation and then kind of snowball it from there. Um, so usually I find, at least in my games, the first few turns are all about like positioning and laying down suppression and taking opportunities. And then like four through six is where you're really just trying to hit them with everything at once. And I see a lot of Rebel players too, just trying to like rush Luke in there. Um, you know, and actually I did this too when I first started playing because I came from 40k where like generally with your melee units, the, the strategy is you want to get them engaged and hacking stuff as quickly as possible. Um, and that's kind of what I did initially with Luke and he just kept dying 
really early. Um, so now I use it more as like a control piece and I kind of try and hit my opponent's line with him at the same time that I'm hitting them with everything else all at the same time. So, yeah. And to that, I would say with Luke, and this was something, um, you know, that I, I kind of, when Chris and I played, so we played in the tournament this Saturday, um, you know, he was my only lost. He ended up going first place at the tournament and, you know, the way he played Luke was very much to that style. And so he had brought Luke just as an example, he had brought Luke up uh, put him into melee combat with my snow troopers. He ended up getting rid of a couple of them, but then we went into the next round. And so what I did was I, I gave my snow troopers the order. I ended up winning priority uh, just on a, just on a die roll, right? We both had, we both played one pips and I ended up getting the roll and I withdrew my troopers and they were snow troopers. So I could only go movement one, but I just kind of moved them around a building and so it really made uh, Chris choose like what I wanted him to do was come up and try to kill those troopers because now he was within range with no cover or line line of sight blocking of the rest of my army. And so it was a good opportunity to kind of tease him in to kind of kill him. But instead, he just he just moved the other way and was like, OK, well, then I won't really combat with Luke right now. I'll wait for another opening. And I think that was really a smart way to play it. And I, I liked that versus what I've seen with other uh, other players. That's definitely one of the hardest things about this game is figuring out where that really fine line between committing to an aggressive move and like knowing when to take a step back and maybe kite your opponent or do something like that um like, like where that inflection point is uh, it's not always clear though most of the time it is I, I agree completely like um there's like a bit of a pressure this is something that i've encountered as well there's a bit of a pressure i feel like i need to always be doing something like if i'm not shooting it's bad and that while that was true for other miniature games i've played where um time on target was an important issue because you might not get a chance to shoot later in the round. This is X-Wing specifically. Um, Legion doesn't necessarily suffer from that because the units have ranges and most units can shoot in any direction. And uh, yeah, I mean, attacking is not always the best option. And it's we have to learn not to, or at least I have to learn not to dive on something if I see it happen. And I could just have to read the board and, you know, say, do I need to be patient? I... Or do I need to actually do this attack? I'd like to caveat that with attacking is very is generally optimal. Uh, it, it's only when it becomes like if it's clear you're going to take a bad trade is when you probably should take a step back. Like generally speaking, attacking is still where you want to be. It, it's just like maybe you should take a step back and take a less good attack um, as opposed to the one that's going to put your you know, Luke out in the opening, get him fried, or your Rebel Trooper squad out in the opening, get him fried. Um, I, I think that or Vader. or Vader, yeah. I think sp speaking of Vader and and like Snow Troopers, I think those are, I think that the three units that are most likely to kind of get left out to dry in the game presently are Luke, Vader, and Snow Troopers. At least those are the three that I see it most commonly with. Um, just because it's very tempting to go in and delete a whole squad with luke or vader that feels very powerful or with snow troopers and fleets as well yeah i'll just add fleets to that Fle list fleets have like a little bit more range like like wiggle room because generally they can like step up to range two and delete their target and hopefully everybody else is like a little bit farther away um yeah then you roll like 10 blanks on your white dice and you totally play. totally i mean i was playing a game the other day where i, <laughs> I picked up like 11 black dice with my impact you know flamer squad i rolled like eight hits um and i killed like one model and i was just like oh man i'm so overextended right now this is a mistake uh and this it, it was yeah um just went really boring. well you were playing the odds though right like it wasn't a bad choice in on paper right i mean the thing is that like, sometimes you know, even if it's like an 85 percenter, right? You're like, okay, I have an 85 percent chance to wipe that squad. Is 
the fifteen percent of the time where you just completely whiff, and I'm just spitballing on the math. I don't know exactly what the scenario was, but let's assume that it was something like that. Like, is is just completely losing that squad fifteen percent of the time worth it? Because that that's what's going to happen if you don't delete the other unit generally. Um, so I don't know. I I think that overall, like I know that one of the biggest flaws in my gameplay is that I tend to be overly aggressive. Um, just that as just how I play games, I would rather be force my opponent into making bad choices generally, but sometimes trying to do that, um, I make bad choices myself. So, yeah. And I think to your point, uh, and this, you know, this kind of falls into that tactics and strategy standpoint is understanding that if you're going to push Vader, Luke, or even snow troopers into a position where they're going to, potentially wipe out an an entire unit you have to realize you're going to wipe out an entire unit and is that going to leave you vulnerable now because you get you get that high or or that excitement about okay i can take them out and then that gets me whatever my objective is uh to the next you know either to go grab an objective or for mov whatever 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 you're looking to do and sometimes i think that clouds your judgment and the fact that oh man that unit's going to be gone and vader and luke are just going to be hanging in the wind as my opponent moves the rest of his 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 army up to then to just have open fire on that on that unit yeah i think it's especially easy to get like that blood rage with units like you described vader luke snows units that have high damage potential um you know i call it uh with luke i call it the luke rage um, I don't know if you ever uh, you guys have played 40k, but you know the God Corn. There, his saying is more more skulls for the skull throne, which basically means collect as many skulls as you can. And with Luke, it's like more helmets for the helmet throne with stormtroopers. Um, <laughs> when I when I first started playing Luke, it's like you know I'd be like, oh, he's moving a stormtrooper unit within range two of Luke. He's gonna charge and kill him, and then he'd charge and kill him, and then there would be you know like four more stormtrooper units sitting there that hadn't activated yet. And suddenly he's out there with his ass in the wind and you're like, Oh, well, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. He does his thing, but then it's like, Oh, I don't have cover. Oh, I don't have a dodge token. Oh, there's five things shooting me. Great. And then he just, he just, you just lose him. Right. For the sake of like the one stormtrooper squad that was, that looked vulnerable. Yep. A- anytime you trade down like that is just, you know, I, and that's the thing with, with those, with those specific units, Generally speaking, the target you're firing at is almost always uh, less valuable than the unit you're firing with, generally. Right, and that that definitely doesn't mean like never charge them in there. You absolutely have to. Um, But make sure you're doing it in a way that is calculated. You know, like engage a unit that's already activated so that they can't withdraw from you. or you know, do it near the end of the turn so there's less units to shoot you. Um, do it when you're engaging your opponent's army with the rest of your army at the same time. So it's you know like a saturation of threats. Um, it, we're, we're definitely not saying like never get them in there because you absolutely have to with those guys. But uh, just well, do yeah, it, I, just do it in a way that's smart. Right, and it's just being it's just being aware of the next steps, right? And I think something that and I I don't know how your guys' experience has been in this, but my experience has been in, I don't, this may be an over-exaggeration, but I'll say it and you guys can shoot me down. It's almost like I feel like people sometimes forget that you can withdraw. And so you end up getting in a melee combat situation and both the aggressor and the defender seem to forget that withdraw is a thing. So it's like, They'll either get in combat and try to hold the combat, and then you're like, "Well, I'm just going to withdraw." So then these guys can light you up, or vice versa. You know, the other or getting into combat with like stormtroopers with Luke, and then the stormtroopers try to punch Luke, and it's like, "Well, that's that's silly." Unless you're trying to kill him before his activation, right? That's really the only time that you know. But it's just it just seems odd that sometimes people forget about withdraw. I I think that overall the melee rules are underutilized and underabused by the majority of players um include withdraw action included i think a lot of people are like oh man i'm a range two with this two-man stormtrooper squad i should shoot something uh, just because like it doesn't even occur to them that 
double moving them into melee with something just to like shut that unit's activation down next turn it's probably way more valuable especially with storms you know where those red saves if your uh, target doesn't have pierce and melee like that can really go a long way um you know i see that people make this mistake a lot with irg and wookies where they'll, where they'll like charge a storm unit and then it'll take them like three turns and they'll have one wookie left at the end of it after engaging that story unit you know, like that's that's not a good trade. <laughs> yeah, this is like one hundred two level legion where you're like looking at the board and being like, okay, um, how, what 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 can I take away by running something into melee now? And that's, that's not something that's not your basic legion for sure. It's sort of like you know, it really has to be like a calculated thing and sort of you sort of look at the board and you're like, okay, well, here's like a full stormtrooper unit you know, they haven't activated yet, and I got my you know, two two man squad left or whatever. My we're a heavily damaged squad, but we're in we're within range two of each other. If I can go into melee with that squad, that means they have to either punch my crappy unit or they have to withdraw, which means they don't get to attack at all this turn. Um, that's also extremely good for um, yanking people out of zones, which is something we saw because we actually just uh, watched the last game of the the team league. And on breakthrough, there was an interesting moment where a scout trooper with one wound left. Um, uh, he engaged the backside of a formation of Wookiees and the Wookiees were pulled out of the deployment zone because they had to snap into melee. And so that unit leader was forced out of the deployment zone by the going into melee effect. And that actually won um, the Imperial player that game. Uh, Garn won his game or Garn won his game on that technicality when it, was, it seemed it seemed hopeless. But he managed to pull that off at the last second to squeeze the win in. And just steal it from uh, from Jay. It was pretty amazing. Yeah, and so I guess with that, um, is there any other kind of, uh, I guess, recommendations or just things in that sense from a tactical standpoint or strategic standpoint that you know? I'm sure there's a number of people listening to this that are going to be at LVO and will be at Adepticon. Is there maybe just like reminder notes that we should we should send out to people from a tactical standpoint while playing? Hey, what's left to go over there is a really good question to start asking all the time. Yeah, and that speaks to communication, which we can talk about when we get to like tournament etiquette. But it's always good to know like which units your opponent has not activated yet, because activation timing is super important. We could spend a whole episode on activation timing. Yeah. And then I, I'll add in, uh, I think this is where, <clears throat> and, and I may be wrong, but I, I think clock time is going to be huge in Vegas and probably in Adepticon too. I think clock management is going to win games. That's just my view right well, now. I mean, when you have the ball, you know, for 20 minutes and a half and the other team only has 10, sometimes you uh, win the game, you know? No, 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 uh, no, 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 Go Pats. Oh, oh my God. Uh, I just, uh, I hate them so much. I hate them. I had all. to get it in there. I felt, I feel obligated a little bit. Oh, as, God. as a member of the evil empire, I feel obligated to talk about clock management, so here we are yeah and i'm just always gonna be sad because buffalo bills <laughs> it's just just an eternity in football hell well, you, uh, you got like another five years in football hell and then you can then you can start winning the division again that's, yeah that's what they always tell us and then we we go to four super bowls and lose everyone uh so so we'll be we'll be fine. there you go we'll see you at super bowl um, 57 but but like <laughs> not going too deep down the football rabbit hole uh some advice generally speaking i think as far as all games go don't don't go and try something you've never done before like stick to the essentials stick to what you know and make use out of the skills that you have don't try and throw a hail mary unless that's your only out yeah an adjacent point as well if you see something, if you see some like strategy for your or tactic for your upcoming round that's like technically brilliant but is fraught with risks, just stop. Don't don't be that person who like tries to do this flashy play and just gets it cut apart by your opponent's you know dice or some chance that you didn't take into account, just blowing up in your face like that. That'll that's just an easy way to lose a game. So 
don't don't get too don't get too get too caught up in the possibilities. Just look at we'll look at the essentials, like like Dash was saying, or yeah, Dash was saying it. Yeah, I would say too, um, and this is something I'm guilty of as well as anybody who's been listening to the podcast will know is if you right now are sitting there questioning what list you're bringing to LVO, um, you need to go back to basics and and go back to a list that was working for you. So like if you had a list maybe a month ago that you felt really comfortable with and you were doing well with and you understand the list and you know all its intri- intricacies, I would I would go back to that list and I would just bring that list. Don't try to bring something new to Vegas. Yep, best list is the one you know. Um, just just two, two quick like LVO specific slash tournament specific bits of advice. You talked about clock management. Um, just to elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, we are going to have, I think, like a giant TV with a clock on it. So you should always at least have access to know like wh- how much time you have left. Um, and just sort of realize that it's very possible that your games aren't going to finish. And remember that you score objectives when, when time runs out. So um, the schedule is going to be two hours for game time. And then when you hit two hours, you finish whatever round you're on. Um, and then there's like a dice down full stop at two hours and 15 minutes. So, for example, if you're like just getting into round five at two hours and you don't finish round five, you know, whatever you're doing in the middle of round five, when two hours and 15 minutes are gone, uh, you stop. So just be aware that like that's when objectives are going to be scored. Um, So if you are playing the long game, make sure you're playing like fast enough for the game to actually finish. Um, I know that I get caught in that trap a lot because, like I said earlier, I tend to be opportunistic in the first few turns and then just try and hit with a hammer in the last few. Um, and if there are no last few turns, then maybe that strategy is uh, not great. So, um, you know, just just make sure that you're aware of how much time you have left and what your objectives are and that you need to score those objectives when the time runs out and not necessarily when the turns run out. Yeah, and I think I think along those lines. So turn one is is usually a bad turn to gauge how fast the or slow the game's going. It's usually by the end of round two or maybe midway through round two, you can have a pretty good idea on how long that game's going to end up going, based on activations and what op- objectives you're playing. And so that's really when you want to start looking at the clock is by the end of round two, and saying, okay, there's. X time, I think we're going to get two rounds or I think we're going to get maybe one round. I, You know what I mean? It may be real bad. I, it just all depends on the game. And so just recognizing that and understanding what the objectives are to try to, you know, to try to make sure you have the most points one way or another. And definitely don't like, we'll talk about slow playing in tournament etiquette, but don't do that. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. If, uh, you know, you, you still want to be playing as fast as you're able. And hopefully you've gotten some practice in with the two-hour time limit. Um, and I know we've mentioned this article before, but Nick Freeman wrote a great one on basically just like how to learn to play faster. Um, I think it's, it's called Castle Run in 12 Parsecs or something like that. Um, but like essentially you need to practice playing fast if you're going to a tournament. And it's probably, you know, hopefully you can get another game or two in in between now and then with a timer. But you definitely want to be practicing with a timer. Just, just if nothing else, so you're aware like, of how far into a game you generally get. Um, the other quick, just tournament specific bit of strategic advice I wanted to mention is um, when you show up to a table, obviously you don't know who's going to be blue and who's going to be a red player. Um, blue player gets to pick a side. The tables are not necessarily going to be symmetrical. Don't be afraid if you're blue player to walk all the way around to the other end and pick that other side. Um, I know that you feel time pressured in a tournament and you're like, whatever, I'm on this side, I'll just take that side, but really give it a good think uh, before you make that decision. If you end up as blue player, because terrain makes a big difference and the boards are not going to be symmetrical. That doesn't mean they won't be fair, but um, you know, this is not going to be like an ITC 40 K setup where there's like a predefined perfectly, you know, symmetrical quadrant of terrain. Um, the boards are going to have some variety. So you know, don't be afraid to walk around to the other side if, if that's what you want to do as blue player. Yeah, and I would even say, like, as you're approaching the table, like, I try to, like, even before people set their stuff down, I'll just be like, hey, how many points you running? You know, and then be like, okay, you're going to be blue, or okay, I'm going to be blue, I got 798, or what? you know what I mean? And just trying to have that 
conversation so that you get it started before people even put their stuff down so that you encourage them to be like, oh, right, I got to look at the board. Yeah, there's a little wrinkle to that, which is that you you need to put two barricades down before you oh, tell your right. opponent, forgot, yep. um, you know, who's blue and who's not. Um, I'll let uh, I'll let my superiors explain exactly how that's going to work on the day of the tournament, but but don't just show up and tell your opponent your points. Um, Sorry, from the get go. For, I forgot that we were doing the barrier thing. That's right. yeah, no worries. That's I mean that's my habit as well. Like that was my habit at Nova. You know, show up. That's the first thing you do because. There's no point in taking your stuff out on one side of the table if your opponent's going to take it from you. But, um, you know, do the barricades first. So don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that should be like the second thing you do. But Okay. All right. So place your barricades and then ask about points. Yeah. and Actually, don't take just it. put your barricades in your pocket. And then you don't have to get all your stuff out, right? You just you just place them out on the board, and then you you move on, and then you're not like unpacking everything. That's another like uh, we're getting way down a rabbit hole here, but just logistically sure. speaking, um, if you have your stuff on like a magnetic tray or something like that, so it's easy to take out and put away, um, that also helps a ton. And they also sell like um, uh, hopefully you're using some kind of like card holder template so you can just like r whip your activations out and put them right on your side of the table without having to pull all your cards and stuff out individually. Oh um, God. Yes. Those are, even if you have those uh, like the binder inserts, the, the smaller ones, those are so much easier than trying to like watching people stack their cards out drives me crazy. Yeah. yeah please. Trying to make sure I save my life as well. I'll just yeah, say, please I, invest I, I, in those. Having a, having a wooden tray that you can just put all your stuff into, or any sort of tray, huge lifesaver and for logistics purposes, especially because, you know, you're going to try to cut down as much as you can on the time between between rounds, like trying to transfer from one table to another. And, you know, it's also a thing for your, your fellow players as well. If you're slow packing up, you know, you're in their way as well. So it works. It works both for you and for the person on that table after you. You have to be pretty, pretty quick about packing up. It's a good segue to schedule and uh, tournament regs and etiquette yeah. as well. Yeah, yep. let's do it. All right. So schedule. Um, you can register as early as eight a.m. on Thursday. I'm sorry, on Friday, not on Thursday. Please don't show up on Thursday. Oh God, <laughs> I'm showing up on Thursday. Um, <laughs> 8 a.m. on Friday, February 8th. Um, and uh, dice start getting rolled at 9 a.m. So um, if you're not there by 9 a.m., um, please don't like get plastered the, the night before uh, and expect to show up at 9 a.m. <laughs> fully alert and ready oh, to play Legion. That was my master strategy. Um, you're, you're spec. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's Vegas, but your spot will get, be given to someone else. Well, I'll be there, there on time, time so. but I may be plastered. You know, it's gonna be late night. <laughs> uh, hey, we're rooming together, so I don't want any uh hey, man. shenanigans. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I prefer a little spoon. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, I know so where that, the party's going to be, boys. That was louder than I intended it to be. <laughs> um, all right. So rounds are two hours and 15 minutes. You got 15 minutes between each round um, in addition to that. And then uh, there is lunch, which is one hour starting at 145. So it's uh, registration, two rounds, lunch, two more rounds, and then um, a top cut after which there will be 12 players in six games. So if you're lucky enough to make the top cut. Um, it is Swiss, and basically the top 12, as determined by Swiss rankings, will be the top cut. So um, that's going to be pretty much all the 4 and O's, and then I forget the exact number of 3 and 1s, but there will be um, a significant it's, number of 3 and 1s. It's, it's like 8, isn't it? That sounds right. Yeah, so I was going to bring that up because... The majority of the players going into the top twelve will be three and ones. So if you if you end up losing a game, don't fret, my friends. Like, keep going hard. Um, you still have a very good chance of making it. Yep, you're still in it if you drop a game. So and then um, and then it'll be seated 
based on your ranking and not top 12. So like number one, we'll play number, number 12, etc. And then the six winners of those games will get invites. So good luck, gents. We're going to need it. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm really excited. I'm, I'm excited too. I hope all you guys make it. I'll be, I'll be secretly rooting for you and hopefully not judging on your tables. I think I finally <laughs> settled on a list. Uh, yesterday, I finally settled on it. I've been playing some variation of Twins, and I finally figured out what I want to run for real this time. So, Does it involve guys wearing white armor? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Uh, Only when so they dress okay. up like stormtroopers for ridiculous. a little bit, right? Yeah, exactly. Um. <laughs> Someone, what other? What other? Was, sorry, wasn't ahead. someone making a stormtrooper model with a, a Luke and a Han head swap? I mean, uh, that but, seems like that would be pretty easy to do, actually. Yeah, you could do like a Han head swap for the DLT trooper. That'd be pretty funny. That would be amazing. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I wanted to hit the tournament regs too. So um, we did do an, a sort of addendum, not a sort of addendum. It is an addendum to the FFG tournament regs. You can find that on the LVO Facebook page. And I'm sure we can also figure out a way to link it in the show notes. If people are curious. Uh, basically, this is derived from the ITC rules on player conduct and um, decorum and missed opportunities and game state and judging philosophy. Um, there's a ton of stuff in here that's not like explicitly covered by the FFG tournament regs. I'm not going to go into all of it. It's like a seven page document. Um, but you can basically distill the advice in here down to two things. Number one, communicate clearly with your opponent um, at all times about what they're doing and what you're doing. And number two, don't be a douche. Um, I like it. So if you can obey those two primary guidelines, then you don't have to worry about anything else in this. Um, but essentially it outlines, you know, what sort of conduct is expected of you. Um, you know, things like don't use abusive language. Um, don't try and deceive or mislead your opponent on things like rules. Um, uh, don't touch your miniatures if you're not moving them, things like that. Um, also like there's a lot in here about playing by intent. Um, which is a pretty common concept in miniatures wargaming, but basically it means that you should, um, for ease of play, basically like narrate what you're doing and what you intend on doing and what you expect the outcome will be when you're doing things that don't involve dice. So for example, if you're measuring, uh, like if you intend to, say you have like a fleet trooper unit and you intend to move them uh, up to exactly range two of like an IRG squad, then you say, I'm going to activate the fleet trooper unit. I'm going to, you know, put the movement tool against their base and I'm going to move them and I'm going to put the range two movement tool on the table and uh, uh, the range ruler and I'm going to bump it right up against range two of these IRG. I intend to be exactly range two from this IRG. And then you do it and you say, do you agree that I'm exactly range two from these IRG? And your opponent says yes. Um, and the reason that's important is because if, you know, like sometime later those IRG activate, and say they got bumped or something, um, you know, and your opponent like double moves them and somehow they're in base contact with your fleet troopers, you can say, you know, we agreed last turn that they were exactly range two away, which is too far for two speed two moves. So um, essentially one of the things that says in this document is that when you're playing by intent, agreements about things like range are binding. So like if your opponent agreed last turn that you successfully moved your fleet troopers to be exactly range two away from those IRG, then even if they turn out not to be, then that's what the range is supposed to be, if that makes sense. And that goes for things too, like objectives. Like when you're moving into an objective zone, say I intend to move this unit leader into range one of this transmission uh, for intercept. Um, do you agree that I did so? Yes. And then next turn, when it comes to score that objective, your opponent can't say that guy's not in range one of that, uh, of that intercept. So that's just what like playing by intent means. But essentially, you just want to be like constantly communicating with your opponent. Um, it'll be a better play experience for both of you, and it'll also like eliminate, you know, later arguments and gray areas. 
And I would say, and I, I know that that just for some people out there, like that sounded a little bit, um, I, I think most players are doing that anyways, when you're talking, when you're like, okay, I'm going to move these guys up to the objective. Yep. They're in range one. Do you see that? You know, I, I think it's, it happens in the conversation, but just make sure that you're getting their agreement when, when you do that stuff, I, th- I think is the most important part of that. Yeah, I think most people play that way, and most people do those things. It's just, it, especially in a tournament environment, it's helpful to spell it out, um, you know, Agreed. when the stakes are high. So it, it only helps you uh, to narrate as much as possible um, and to communicate with your opponent. So, um, you know, you're not like sh- tipping your hand by telling your opponent that you're moving a unit and you intend to be a certain range away, if, you know. So don't be afraid to just communicate and self-narrate as much as possible. <laughs> Um, the other thing about don't being a douche, uh, so there is a system in here about fouls, um, like in soccer, there are yellow cards and red cards and disqualifications. Um, we hope to not have to use any of that stuff, but essentially like if there's a violation, if a player makes an illegal move or, you know, cheats or something, again, we don't anticipate any of this, but, um, there are, uh, provisions outlined in here f- for punishments. So for example, you know, if you do something that creates an illegal game state, we can, um, you know, and the other person calls a judge, we can show up and re- reverse that game state and then potentially penalize further depending on like the intent, perceived intent of the player. So um, that's stuff to be aware of. Um, but if you're not a douche, then hopefully uh, it's not something that you ever have to um, be involved with yourself. So and I would say on the opposite corner of that, just sorry, I'm just pl- trying to play the everyday man here, right? Um, I wouldn't get too worried about someone calling you on something that was maybe accidental or something you d- you just didn't realize. I think the judges are all very smart people and they're going to be able to see that for you. So don't don't like freak out if you accidentally do something or, you know, if you if you make a mistake, Um it'll it'll wash out people people will understand what happened yeah and that's where you know that's where like self-narrating helps a lot too because it'll be clear to your opponent what it is that you're trying to do so like you know if you put the movement tool up against luke and you're like i'm moving luke here and then like you sneeze or something and knock luke across the table and he ends up somewhere else your opponent can't be like oh you wanted to put him there there he is you know so yeah um yeah it I wouldn't like anticipate your opponent calling you and hopefully on every single little thing, you know, just be Um, careful. Yeah. Just be careful and have fun. Like don't, you know, don't overthink this kind of stuff. Um, but just make sure you're communicating with your opponent. And also, uh, it goes into just don't be afraid to call a judge. You know, there's three of us. Um, we will be around. So, um, and we don't have anything better to do. And more specifically, we're there to, uh, you know, judge dis- disputes and rules calls. So, um, and I think I think my, us. yeah, my personal uh, belief, and this is where I think people need to call judges. Is I think sometimes there may be a range call or a line of sight call that neither of you can agree on, and I've seen tendency for people to just not bullied, but you know, just like if the other person's really emphatic about that, that was not. No, I. You can't see his arm. You, you know that they'll just be like, "All right, man, whatever. Don't do that. Call a judge. That's why they're there. Just be like, hey, uh, let's just get the judge and see what they say." Yeah, just keep it cool and call a third party. There's no need to to embark on a, you know, shouting match or any kind. Yeah, don't don't think there's some kind of stigma, like that you're being a douche to your opponent if you call a judge in a situation like that. You know, that's what that's what we were there for. So. Yeah, I would say any and and sorry not to beat this down, but like anytime you're questioning a, a call a, during the game, just and and you don't feel comfortable, just call a judge. Just be like, you know what, man, I really I just want to get a judge call on this because it's just making me uncomfortable, and that's it. Yep. Uh, you guys got anything else on like tournament etiquette? Can you can you talk about the foul system a little a little, a little further? Just um. What what are you what are you giving penalties for? Like specifically, is it just anything that the anything that the judge is the judge deems it deems it worthy of? Yeah. So, um, 
you know, it says in the document, a foul is defined as an action taken by a player that violates the spirit of the game, the rules of the game, and or the rules set and guidelines set forth in this document. But mostly it's going to be things like, um, I'm trying to, I, I can't even think of some examples because most people don't like do things that are going to run uh, a foul, no pun intended, of this um, document. But like if you just move your guy without putting a range, a, uh, a movement tool down and it looks like you moved too far or, you know, you picked up too much suppression between rounds or something like that. Um, things that alter the game state in ways that are not correct, generally speaking, um, are going to be fouls. And then, um, especially if they appear to be intentional and then, uh, you know, things like verbal abuse, uh, stuff like that. So, yeah. It's, and it's something that I would keep an eye on for, for people playing the new stuff is the healing droids and the astromech droids with the wounds and stuff. Just make sure you're paying attention to which unit they're healing and etc. because I think that can get confusion, confusing, especially if they have multiple droids out on the board. That's just something I've seen. So just, just keep an eye out on that as something new. Yeah. I mean, like I said, like, Generally speaking, that like there, so I want to I want to be clear too. There is a there is a difference between honest mistakes and things that will be fouls. Um, like ninety eight percent of things that you do that um, are going to be just honest mistakes. But you know things like changing dice after they're rolled, um, stuff like that, that could be an issue. So it I don't anticipate. Like I said, I'm, I'm hopefully we're not going to issue any yellow cards or red cards or anything like that. Um, but this document is there as a backstop in case we run into issues like that. So I'm not, I'm not sure if that fully yeah, answers is... your question or not, but no, it does. It does. Yeah. I, I suspect that, uh, out of the 64 players, 62 of them probably will never have to worry about or even ask about the file system or interact with it at all. That's, that's my hope anyway. I mean, my hope is, you know, nobody does, but, um, like I, I would be surprised if we had to do this um, frequently. Everybody's everybody there is an adult, you know. We're, we're all there playing with little plastic space dudes to have fun. So um, this document is just a backstop in case somebody, uh, you know, turns that fun into something that's not in keeping with the rules and and or is abusive to their opponent. So. Yeah, and I guess so. Let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily rules breaking or abusive, but I think there's things to watch out for as a player. And uh, we we were talking about this in the chat a little bit. Uh, what was it yesterday or the day before? But one of the things is when you're playing, um, if you've got an opponent who's talking a lot, there's there is this. I don't know if it's a whatever you want to call it. It's a, a tactic, I guess, where they will state the intent of what you're going to do to almost manipulate your next move. So to be like, oh, hey, that snow trooper is going to move into melee contact with Luke now, isn't he? You know what I mean? And <laughs> and that probably isn't the best move for you, but you're like, oh, I didn't even think of that. And then, you know what I mean? So uh, that's just, I, I think we should have a little segment here about just things to look out for. So like a recommendation there would be, I would just shut down listening to them unless it's something specific about their movement or range. Um, and if they're talking about your army or talking about something else, just tune them out the comms jammer upgrade it's the one case that this upgrade is actually worth anything just to <laughs> give putting information in your opponent's head that the they uh, don't necessarily or hadn't considered before and just kind of scrambling their thinking just by saying that stuff out loud i mean it's not technically illegal but it's also like kind of bad form <laughs> but i mean sometimes it's like um you just that i i'll just i'm talking because i think i'm guilty of this of what a what uh, Jay's describing, but also it's sort of like a nerves thing, possibly. At least in my case, it's a nerves thing. It's not intentionally trying to deceive my opponent. It's kind of a nerves thing where it's like the anxiety I get from playing kind of bleeds over into just talking. You kind of get a little, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, verbal diarrhea. <laughs> your uh, your inner monologue becomes your outer your outer monologue a little bit. So. Uh, so I mean I don't I don't know if I've ever encountered that intentionally like someone's like trying to intentionally mislead me into making a, a subpar choice and I think in that case that would definitely be a foul 
but yeah, I mean, if, if it's distracting to you, definitely having to tune that out is highly recommended. Well, and I guess I'm just saying it in a way like and and I, I don't necessarily even it doesn't even need to be nefarious. It could be like you said, like you're just nervous and you're just talking and you're like, oh, no, now you're going to do this. And maybe you mentally didn't even think about that. I just don't even let that stuff get to you. Just keep doing what you were doing, like because whatever your idea you had in your mind, you need to you need to kind of win and lose on your own merit. And so don't don't listen to other people. Just do whatever it is you were going to do and don't let them get into your head. It is possible, too, that, you know, your opponent might be like genuinely offering you advice. Um, that does happen, too. But, you know. oh, I agree. Um, yeah. If you're if your opponent's talking too much, just tell them that you want to focus. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, it's not out of bounds. Um, a couple other things I just wanted to highlight that could be like considered fouls are like slow, intentionally slow playing. Um, uh, I think I mentioned earlier um, intentionally deceiving the other player on rules. Um, you know, this is often like shorthand for that is rules bullying. Basically, like you interpret a rule in your favor and you aggressively uh, assert that that is the correct interpretation, such that you discourage your opponent from calling a judge or looking it up. Um, that could be a problem too. So um, don't do those things. And if your opponent is uh, doing those things, call a judge. So again, we don't anticipate any of this, but you know, we got to talk about it. You want to take a moment. We can clarify also the rules about rolling too many dice and rolling too few dice. Uh, so it, oh, yeah. Not, not intentionally, just it's a mistake. It's like, Oh, maybe you accidentally rolled five whites in your Z six or something. Yeah. So actually, um, you know what, I'm going to put this in here because it's not in there. Um, but that's a good thing to add explicitly to this document. But um, generally speaking, the rule is if you roll accidentally roll too few dice, you just add dice and you roll those additional dice that you've added. And um, if you roll too many dice, then you just subtract dice and then re-roll your entire pool. So there is there is a convention for that. Yeah, and there is a moment where it might be you know, you might say, oh, he rolled this really good roll, but it was too many dice. Um, that's that's what that's supposed to fix. Because, I mean, well, obviously, when you add or take away dice from a pool, the, the odds are different, and you want to actually do a roll with the correct odds. And sometimes it works out in your favor, but it's it's definitely, like, it's not something anyone is, is deliberately doing or attempting to control. No one, I think, in their right mind would add an extra die in the hope of get, having a re-roll chance. I think that's completely, like, outside the scope of what people would do. Um, so just it, you just have to accept what what happened and move on and not dwell too heavily on man if I only if I only had rolled the correct number, but you know how to avoid that is just having the having piles out on the table of uh, correct quantities of dice that you can just shift from, and you just sort of clean that up by prep and uh, making sure that you count every time before you put those dice into the into the box or whatever. Oh, yeah, use a dice tray too. If I mean it's not required, but it definitely helps. So you don't have like extraneous dice that your opponent isn't sure are part of the role. And, you know, this goes back to communicating too, obviously, like when you're making an attack, say I'm attacking this unit with this unit and it has X number of dice and they, they search to hit or whatever, you know? So, um, yeah, but yeah, that's the convention. If you roll too few, you add, you add dice and you reroll the added dice. If you roll too many, you subtract and then you reroll the entire pool all over again. It's also super nitpicky. Um, don't reach into the dice tray to convert surges. Agreed. Oh yeah, please don't do that. But everybody knows what the surges are supposed to be. Just leave them there. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, it just wait. It's it wastes time and it also compromises the integrity of what's what's seen. I would also say too, um, if you're going to do like an aim action, confirm with your opponent beforehand in case you accidentally tip one of the dice. So make sure you're both in agreement to how many hits and or misses that were there before you reach in for the for the aim reroll. Yep, just say like, so I've got three hits and I'm going to reroll these two dice here. You know, your opponent agrees, and then you pick up the two dice that you're going to reroll. So. Oh, hey, Kyle, let me ask you this. So here, here's a good question. So I'm I'm guessing uh, because they're going to be a giveaway at the thing, but the, the dice bags are legal, correct? 
And so is there any precedent behind that or stacking the order tokens or, or those dice, those dice bags for your order tokens? Okay. Yeah. I mean, whatever you want to do, if you want to put them in a, put your order tokens in the bag, put them in the bag. If you want to stack them on the table, do that. Like whatever you're used to is fine. It's not, it's not like required that you do it one way or the other. Okay. Just asking. Yep. Um, the tokens, the new order tokens are smooth. So, um, unlike most poker chips. So they're, uh, you know, you can't tell just by feel like what the token is supposed to be. So it's totally cool to put them in a bag and shuffle the bag. Yeah. I saw, I saw some this weekend. They're real nice. Yeah. I'm excited to see them. I bet they're super clicky too. So you have a lot of fun with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, okay. I, like click, I like clicky things. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> oh, I know. As, oh, you as, know. The, as the producer, I've I've realized, yes. Oh yeah. Endless loves clicky things. As, every, as everyone as everyone who's uh everyone who's ever tuned into my stream knows who's heard me type on stream because I have to. There's no way around it. <laughs> um so how do we feel? Do we feel like we've covered etiquette? Do we want to move into lists, our lists, or meta? what we think the meta is going to be. I'll let you guys decide. Lists? I don't know. Do y'all want to talk about lists? I think it's probably a good place to start. Yeah, I kind of sure. want to hear about your guys' lists. Oh, it's super, super secret. <laughs> nobody nobody has any idea what I'm playing. Yeah, no, no one at all. It's secret. Nobody's ever going to find out. And it's just, it's like, you know, I don't know. Big You're gonna need an X-wing squadron to come out of the sky randomly on some like remote planet to find me and my list, and um, yeah, that's all I got to say about it. Triple ray shielded, you know, guarded by turbo lasers, whatever. Perfect. Yeah, Krennic's gonna walk out onto the <laughs> thing and shoot Galen or so. Spoilers. Yeah, spoiler <laughs> alert. Uh, I mean. I'll talk about my list. <laughs> I don't. I I don't care. I I don't think it's going to affect how I play or get played against one way or the other. So, uh, can you not hear the sarcasm in my voice, Jay? No, are I are you not I, picking it up? I did. I just um, I was going to go with it. You know, I thought this was mm. going to be like a thing we were going to do. You're not talking I about see, that monstrosity you posted on Facebook earlier. <laughs> I didn't post any. Are you talking? about what jay's playing yeah yeah, yeah what jay's playing is that oh, what the, is that what you're bringing the pictures that i yeah, put that, on yeah the, the one with the the two air speeders and the two cypher strikes uh, yeah i figured it out everybody if you go to the legion group on facebook i figured out the tw the dual air speeder it's a it's a 10 activation list i i got it i got it everybody <laughs> yeah, he finally found he found Just a way sure to use those all right time I think a lot of people took me seriously on that post because the comments were were a little rough. But I was like, yeah. "Dude, no one, no one's ironic or, or sarcastic on the internet. Everyone means everything they say." Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. Do you guys? I I can walk through my list if you want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go for it. I want to hear about it. And we can tear it apart, and and you guys can tell me how much of an idiot I am. So, uh, okay, so let's start with the commander. So I got Veers. Don't bring He's Veers, you idiot. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, go on. All right, he's got a steam leader and improvised orders, okay? I then have uh, three Stormtrooper DLT squads. I have two Snow Troopers with impact grenades and Flame Trooper. I have a Snow Trooper naked with uh, frag grenades. I have a Royal Guard with the Electro Staff and Tenacity. I then have two sniper units and two e webs for a total of twelve activations. That's a lot of activations. That's a lot of activations. <laughs> so, yeah. and I'll just I'll just say this real quick, and then you guys. So, so what happened was, and everybody, you know, I kind of I think I had maybe a mental break on my last podcast, and everybody people were like reaching out to me, like asking if I was okay, like. Uh, uh, Gordon, you guys know Gordon. He he reached out to me. He's like, "Hey, man, is everything okay with your list?" Uh, but really, what it was was I was just like, "Okay, I'm not smart enough to play Boba or like Pelp." I was playing Pelp for a while. It, they're just too complex. And so what I did was I'm like, how can I just simplify this down to things I know, things that I'm good at, and just kind of go back like like you were talking about 40K, but I'll talk about fantasy. Like go back to like the orc and goblins where it's just like I'm just going to overwhelm you with numbers 
And that's how I'm going to try to approach my games. I think I think this is I think it's fine. decent. Yeah. Like, yeah. I I think that any list that is 11 activations plus can win just about any game. Uh it, all it takes is you to like net like plus 2 activations on like a 10 or 11 activation list with your list and you're in really good shape regardless of what units they have. I and I think yeah. The one thing you got to be really careful of is is a lightsaber wielder getting up in your grill. Um, yes. Because you don't really have a lot of tools to deal with that. So, other than shooting them before they get there. Yeah. Don't let them scope your electro staff guard. Is yeah. right. The... Yeah, and what I've found is with the list, it's um, I uh, you know I t- I have a tendency to play them really close to, to the like in proximity. I mean, like range wise, they're really close to each other. And so I feel like the I've I've faced a Vader in ATST, a Luke, and another Vader with this list, and va- and all of them I've gotten considerable wounds on everything before they made it into a range where they could do some damage, and so I've I've felt pretty comfortable with it as far as like taking down Force users before they can like really do some damage, and then you know maybe I'll toss one of the troops that's dwindling in the way to just kind of slow them down. You know what I mean? So then I can shoot them with the rest of the unit once they've killed that unit or I can withdraw and then shoot them. So it's, it's, it's been pretty good. Yeah, that definitely works. Um, you know, I would say just make sure like if you're up against the lightsaber wielder, just keep your IRG in reserve until that lightsaber wielder um, commits to something. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, you 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 keep them behind the lines, behind line of sight, and then once once they've made a committed move, that's yeah, that's how you then roll out the the IRG and say, okay, buddy, now you got to deal with this. Who's next? Well, we did one empire. I guess I can take a crack at it. <laughs> Seeing as I'm the, on this cast in terms of playing, I'm the only rebel player who's playing and not judging. Um, so I've been playing twins for the last two months, basically. Um, not that I haven't tried other lists in the meantime. Like I, I was seriously considering for LVO at first, uh, Luke Han, but, um, I kept running into situations where I'd just lose Han early or, um, I'd really, really regret not having coordinated bombardment to take wounds off the top for my opponent. So I played Luke Han for a while. And then I went back to Wonder Twins with Leia and it was just so, I felt so much freedom because it's like, wow, you know, I'm really like, my opponents really um, respect my bombardment and that actually gives me some positional advantages early because they they super respect the idea that Leia can just deploy and and take like four or five wounds off their list with with some good dice in my favor. And plus it also like discourages sniper teams to deploy with any model showing, which is super useful because that can potentially, I say potentially, because viewers can pass um, snipers aim tokens, potentially deny aim actions on round one. Um, but yeah, I was doing Lucan and then I went to play Wonder Twins and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to try the Wookiees out with my Wonder Twins. And it just didn't quite pan out the way I, I pictured it. And that might have been operator error, because I think some other players who've stuck with the Wookiees have showed me that Wookiees are actually extremely threatening and dangerous. But every time I play against the single Wookiee list, um, you know, maybe I've just had the benefit of my opponents making an error. Maybe I just have too many units, but they'll try to they'll try to come across the field toward me and uh, they'll just get gunned down before they get in contact with me. Um, when I play, when I was playing Luke, Leia, Chewie, I went up against a triple Wookiees list, and my opponent was just too sanguine with them. And I actually deleted two Wookiee units before they made contact with my lines. But the one unit that did get in was like tearing me apart. Like I had to I eventually I had to sick Chewie on them and just try to alpha them away because they were doing so much damage to me. And it was like one of those cases where like you know Chewie would swing at him and deal like five wounds. They'd swing back at Chewie, they deal four wounds. You know, it was like really like who has initiative determines who wins the outcome in that battle. But anyway, after ruling out Luke Han, I just said, okay, well, I'm going to play Wonder Twins. Then I kind of ruled out the Wookiees because, like, man, there's this is a really expensive unit that if I screw up with it, I'm just going to lose 114 points for little to no effect. And then uh, when the specialist came, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do the comm relay stuff. And so I had to 
you know, alter my composition yet again. So I said, okay, well, then I'm going to try Wonder Twins with an officer fleet, 4Z6 as a comm relay, and do triple snipers. Because I think triple snipers, when they roll well, are really oppressive. And how am I going to get around, you know, coordinated fire? Well, one of the best ways to get around coordinated fire is to deal a bunch of suppression early and or take models off the board before they get in range to do it. And uh, Leia and three snipers with a bit of luck, you know, let's say Leia lands every hit and the snipers land every hit that's potentially uh nine wounds but that's really rare it's going to be more like five or six but still like if you concentrate your fire you can potentially weaken or destroy a squad before it gets close to you um so that's one of the biggest reasons i took triple sniper um and bombard um but the fleets just were, weren't really pulling their weight cost wise and so I kind of just went back to basics, and after consulting with Orc for a while, I settled on um, Wonder Twins with a fleet, five Z6 troopers, and three snipers. It's probably the most optimal non wookie Luke list that exists right now. Um, just six core units, three snipers. Um, it takes improv on Leia. Just decide. It does take covering fire because the effect is slightly better than save our skins. I think, and in, in it comes out in the wash kind of. Um, because you probably aren't moving first with your with your heroes anyway, and if you do draw a commander, well, you know Leia going first isn't all that bad, so you might not even need to use improv on that turn. Um, so the relay thing, I think, in in hindsight, was a bit of a trap when I recommended people try it, at least for the rebels. I think Relay is really good on the Imperials, and I'm sure Dashes will tell us more about that when we talk about his list. But, um, yeah, so, it, so I mean, this list has it all. It's got Luke with Force Push, JMT, Emergency Stims, JMT being Jedi Mind Trick, Leia Improv Esteemed, Naked Fleet, 5Z6, 3 Snipers, has a 3-point bid <laughs> on to boot. So it's got it's got a plenty going for it, and I feel pretty good about what I'm taking to LVO now. Uh, you got a shotgun on the fleets, right? Oh yeah, I do have a scatter gun in the yeah. fleet. It's not when I say naked fleet, I mean no like no officer, no, officer, no yep. personnel, no gear, not even environmental gear. It's just raw, raw efficiency and firepower. Boring as hell. It's core spam, but it's it's it works, man. Yeah, I just have, I would... I just have more bodies than my opponent at the end of the game. <laughs> yeah, and I mean for me, you know, I had I had the comms relay and the guy on one of my snow trooper units, and it was fine and it worked great. But I just found that I really missed improvised orders a lot, and so I just kind of switched that fifteen points out and put a steam leader and improvised order on Veers because it just felt better. Yeah, improv is is weird. It's like it's probably the best card. You know, it's among the best cards in the game. Right, because it's it's universal. Like you can use it anytime. Um, it refreshes every time you use it. So, you know, it's and it, it, it does a lot of what Com Relay was trying to do anyway. It takes you most of the way there, because Com Relay is like taking very direct control and saying, "I'm going to force an order token to go somewhere that it wouldn't otherwise go." Where Improv is kind of doing the same thing and just saying, "I'm just going to delay once," mm. and that that's usually enough, right? Yeah, I mean, we we did talk about last week how comms relay is proactive and improv is reactive, right? Mm -hmm. Like if if you need something to go first, um, like in the coordinated fire build where you need or want beers to go first, then you need comms relay. Um, but like if you're just trying to, you know, keep your non-core units in a reactive state, then improv is good for that. But you definitely can't use improv proactively with any sort of reliability you know because then you're just kind of fishing like to pull a token um and that's not very reliable or useful no definitely not yeah so that's all i have to say about that i mean i'm i've been playing this for two months and we'll see if we'll see if it was all worth it <laughs> you know yeah. all right so uh dash how about you you wanna you wanna let us behind the curtain there wizard of oz Oh boy. Uh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I think at this stage in the game, it's probably no surprise to anybody that I'm planning on playing, uh, Veers, Boba, five DLTs, one snow, um, three snipers, and I will have some sort of comms relay officer set up on the storms. Um, hmm. I, I just think it's too good. 
Um, I know that it seems to be a controversial thing right now, um, but but I do think that it's just it's what you need to be doing. So I'm gonna do it. I mean, it's not like Veers Boba was a bad list. Yeah, you know, you know. three weeks ago, <laughs> that, I mean, that was a very optimal top tier list already. I, so I've been playing some Veers Boba with without coordinated fire, and um, it certainly didn't need it, but uh, it, it's um, certainly yeah, it pushes it over the top in my mind. What's, yeah, what's and the... I, I go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, after you. Oh, I was going to say, you know, I think we brought this up on on uh, endless cast of the league there, but I was saying, like, I know we've been talking for a long time about how Luke, arguably the best unit in the game. I, I honestly think it's Boba now. I think Boba's the best unit in the game right now. Um, I mean, like, I can see how that could be a conversation, but but Boba really needs his command cards to shine most of the time like like luke sometimes just deletes units you don't need to even have given him an order some turns um you know he he doesn't need son of skywalker to be good he doesn't need my allies the force to be good all of those cards are fine like you, you you could operate luke without ambush push and assault or with with just those those cards i mean and and luke would still be very playable um and still be very good. I, I think once you take Boba's command cards out of the equation, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is on the turns you're not playing his command cards, he's a significantly weaker piece than than Luke is normally. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I, I think Luke is still the best unit in the game um, for that reason. That doesn't yeah, mean Boba's gonna... not great, especially if you're playing his command cards on important turns. Like his command cards are you know, like awesome swingy, uh, either delete a unit or have good control command cards. Um, but well, and know, I guess can... it comes down to what you're looking at as a as a whole of a unit, right? Because the command cards come with the unit, so it's part of that. Plus his movement speed, plus jump to. Like I think as a as an entire unit with everything he brings to the table, I guess is what I was looking at. And yeah, sure, if you take away his command cards yes he's not as strong but he has them they're there so yeah you know i i that's his ranking as a unit i guess in my mind i i see what you're saying i just um you know you kind of have to give up control of your army to play boba you don't have to do that to play luke you know that's fair. um and 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 not like in Veers Boba, it's really not that big a deal. <laughs> like <laughs> all of the units other than boba and the Veers Boba list are pretty interchangeable for the most part um maybe with the exception of Veers, but on on turns where you're not issuing him an order directly anyways you know when he goes is a little bit less important unless you need to get like a a, a hard inspire off or something but um yeah i mean I, I definitely think he's he's probably the best imperial unit i i think that we can i can say that pretty confidently um He's certainly the most versatile Imperial unit. I think the whipcord effect kind of takes it over the top for me as a Rebel player. Because, like, I mean, I guess in terms of relative strength, like, say I'm playing what, what I would consider the best list for, for Rebels, and then I'm playing that against the what I would consider the best list for Imperials. Well, you have a piece that shuts down my best piece, like, strictly speaking, you know? Uh, all the all the things that are great about my my hero Luke are just kind of getting getting put put aside by whipcord, and uh, and then again of course you know like backpack rocket you know having blast and then combining that with a carbine is also just a really really strong attack. It actually can can wipe out a squad on its own if it's uh, aimed. So it gets pretty it gets pretty serious the kind of damage that Boba can throw over range and of course the mobility is just crazy i think the speed three jump two is probably as mobile as it gets for troopers um so he's got he's definitely got a lot of like the best qualities possible and if i had to you know it, it's still like definitely a toss-up but i think boba there's a lot of times that boba can just mess luke up really bad yeah i mean i'm certainly not saying he's a bad piece like that's not what i'm i'm not even saying he's a good piece he's a he's a great piece 
Um, yeah, yeah. I, I just, you know, he was just countering the fact that I said he's the best. I think he's the yeah. best unit yeah. in the game. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and I still think that even despite what you said, I I still think there's an argument. I think you and I and some other people probably smarter than me could argue with you and just be like, and I don't know that you could come to a definitive. I I, I believe. I, I think that's the beauty of Legion, though. Yeah. That, that's yeah also, yes. I, yeah. I think that um, if the the one major thing other than the attack pool that really sets the two apart is the immune pierce keyword impervious is good but it's not immune pierce um that's fair yep all right so do we want to transition a little bit as we're winding down uh we want to talk about what we're going to see for meta uh actually i haven't heard from evan evan you think uh You've been playing Veer's bikes again. You think that's going to show at LVO, Evan? Uh, probably. Uh, I really hate it now. <laughs> With all the new stuff out, I really just hate it. Uh, bikes explode. Uh, Stormtroop, uh, flame troopers with frag grenades are really mean. Uh, so I mean, if someone brings it, they better be real good with it. Thoughts from the scoundrels? Yeah, I mean, I I think that I think overall, um, bikes could get in there this tournament. I, I think it's something that pe- thinks it's like one of the things people won't they, be expecting. They're still played. Yeah, they have problems against the list that I bring. You know, which is you know bombard taking wounds off, and then like if you get a good bombard that puts two wounds, and then one sniper, it's like pow. There's a, there's your half your half bike immediately. <laughs> Like before they've even moved, and one bike feels real bad. Oh yeah, one bike yeah, feels like, horrible. When uh, I stopped, I remember why I stopped playing it because Bombard and Snipers came out, and I the biggest thing I hate in any miniature game. That's why I never really got into Warhammer is losing stuff turn zero. I feel like that's a really just feels bad mechanic in any game. So I was really always on edge when uh, Maximum Firepower and Coordinated Bombardment came out because uh, they can hit you across the table, infinite range. So I still don't really like Snipers. Uh, but they're part of the game now, so uh, I just have to change what I got to do. Maybe deploy behind line of sight blocking terrain, uh, if that's even possible. That, that's a real win, frankly, if you've got bikes. If you can deploy them behind behind cover, give them orders so they go last, um, you can really, really make that work, I think. The, uh, you know, yeah. All right. So what do, what do we think? I know uh, it's been, I think, I think there's a solid chance of seeing an ATST list in maybe the top 12, I think. Yeah, I think un- it's, it's unexplored territory and it might, LVO might just be too soon, but I have, I have a feeling that Weiss is the dark horse of this tournament. Um, a lot of people have written the ATST off and I think coordinated fire breathes new life into it. And At least for that down. one turn. Huh? And pin down also. And pin down. Yeah, yeah and pin down, yeah. yeah. Just like take out take away that reckless diversion immediately. And especially like Weiss pin down the way it's being read right now is that every single arsenal hit counts as an attack against that unit. So you can potentially s- swat four order tokens away um temporarily. Uh speaking of Slight, very fast tangent, but there were two more um, official forum FAQ posts, uh, one regarding pin down, and it did confirm that, in fact, it works like that. Every unit you know, that's attacked um, uh, has its token return. So, you know, Arsenal 4, you can return four tokens. Not that your opponent would have four tokens, but... Um, and then the other one was just regarding covering fire and splitting fire. Um, there were some people trying to make the case that if you split fire with covering fire, you can get two dodges instead of one, but it, that's not the case. Um, you can only ever get one dodge from an attack with covering fire. So um, those two just hit the forums uh, maybe yesterday or like two days ago. So hot off the press. Yeah. Pin down does work like you say it does. Mm-hmm. I think pin down is going to be good with bikes too. Yeah. Um I'm I'm just I'm 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 skeptical of bikes generally um, for the reasons that that David stated. Um, I play a very similar list and with snipers and Leia and Z6s I rarely have very much trouble with them. But um, you know bikes are really hard to use too. 
Uh, I've, yeah. I've never played Nicky Myland, and I, I feel like if I did, he would uh, he would realign my opinion of bikes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I could see them making it, but if I had to choose between like, you know, an Empire Dark Horse between ATST and bikes, I, I think you'd be more likely to see an ATST. What do you think? What do you think from a rebel perspective? We'll see. Luke all day, but we'll also see um, Luke Ch- or sorry, not Luke Han, but uh, we'll see Luke. It'll probably be Luke, Leia, Luke Han, uh, or we'll see um, Han, Chewie, Leia. That's a thing that is still out there. ATRTs, you think will be? I'll make a make it back. Oh yeah, barbecue, hundred <laughs> percent. So, somebody's well, gonna bring an ATRT. I think you're a bunch of droids like that's definitely gonna happen yeah Yeah. i I think you're gonna see that i don't know if they'll make um top 12 but i think you'll definitely see some people like spam rts with astromex they'll catch someone with their pants down and uh yeah they'll have no pants because they've been burned off (laughs) yeah Uh, (laughs) i I, I love that list spicy chicken combo i i want to make it happen um, and then I think I think Veers Boba, that's another solid list. And I think it's going to be Dash, like you said. I think all the kind of like other stuff you can fill in and make. So I think you're going to see a bunch of variations of it. But I think you're going to see Veers Boba for days. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's sort of like for the most part, re- people are not switching factions. You know, um, if they played Rebels, they're probably still going to play Rebels. If they played Imperials, they're probably going to still play Imperials. I I think the split's going to be, you know, probably the fifty five forty five or sixty forty that we're expecting. And you know, um, I think it's possible we see an ATST hit. You know, do well. I think that's the the biggest component of all of these kind of dark horse. You know. Um, things is that the terrain has to be right for a lot of these units to be successful and from what we've seen at least in the pictures that um lj has posted these boards are a lot more congested than nova and gen con which i think takes away a little bit from things like the atst and maybe gives back a little bit to things like bikes um so we'll see all right, so wrapping up, I, I'll go down the line here. What and the question is going to be: What are you looking forward to most about LVO? And I'll start with uh, let's start with Orc. Orc, what are you looking forward to most at LVO? Uh, I'm just looking forward to meeting everybody. Um, there's going to be a ton of people there that I've only ever met on the Discord or on Facebook, um, and I'm excited to meet all of them. So, uh, Mike, anything anything different for you or? Uh, I mean, I'm uh, going with a very specific purpose in mind. You know, uh, I, I'm definitely going to do some socializing and, you know, probably some casual games and stuff. But I am there to um, redeem myself from losing to to Kyle at Nova um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, kind of secure that high command invite. So um, I, I'm looking forward to being able to not have to worry about that after LVO and if I do have to worry about it there's the last chance qualifier so um we'll see but I would like to kind of get that out of the way David so this trip has a lot of firsts for me it's my first time playing at a large convention um I've only been playing war games for two years so this is kind of like a my first step into a larger world to borrow a phrase um it's also my first time in Vegas, so I'm super excited just about being in Vegas. Um, my wife will be there, and so we won't be spending all of our time at the open. We'll be able to go out and see the see the sights, and we'll actually be able to go see uh, Cirque du Soleil, because she's a big fan of Cirque, and so am I. So we're going to have some fun after the tournament. And of course, uh, the creator's dinner, which is happening at Hofbrauhaus, House, is going to be awesome to you know, just talk and network and see what the future holds for this next year. Yeah, unfortunately. Just, uh, for the content creator side. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm sad that I'm not going to be able to make that. Um, the only flight I could yeah. get was in the afternoon on Saturday. Yeah. So <laughs> I think we ended up booking the same yeah, me flight too. back. Yeah, I think. Yep, yeah, I think we're on the same flight. 
Yeah, I'm leaving. I'm leaving in the morning on Saturday too, so I'm not going to be able just, to make it. All the flights yeah. on Saturday were like four hundred dollars cheaper than any of the ones on Sunday. Yep. So I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to pay an extra four hundred dollars for the flight and an extra, you know, one hundred fifty dollars for the hotel room just to kind of stick around for a day. So. Yeah, it's, I guess uh, those East Coast flights, that's where they get you. Yeah. Yep. Especially if you come from a podunk town like I do. Uh, mm. So I think for me, I'm I'm looking forward to, uh, and I want to say this, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to real competition. Not that we don't have a few players up in this area that are really, really good. I'm looking at you, Cook Boys. But, you know, I, I'm looking forward to like seeing what is really out there because I think we can become insulated. Like even when we do the team league and we see the invader league stuff, I think that's not a real good gauge as far as where people are skill wise. And so I'm really looking forward to see what the skill level is uh, of, of everyone else, but also myself to see where I really do stack up against people. Yeah, playing a this, this is my this might be a little woo woo, but I'm gonna offer this to the for the consumption of the cast and for our audience. Um, when you got two people who are, you know, being friendly with each other and playing a game of Legion and playing playing it at a high level together, presuming there's no like inherent animosity between the two players, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's it's an awesome like it, it's almost like performance art. It's like an expression of the game itself it's a little woo woo i know but but i mean that that itself alone like that experience where it's like the two of you are, are working to create this this um battle that is like visually stunning it's also technically amazing and correct and then you're kind of you're kind of solving a very complex problem together so there's kind of a, a neat little positive hit that i get at least when i encounter that situation at on the table i want to be very clear I'm not solving but I mean, a problem with my opponent. Sorry. I'm creating one. <laughs> right, right. I was about to mention that dichotomy. Um, so, like, some people have to view their enemies as, 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 or not view their, sorry, view their opponents as an enemy. And I'm sort of trying to view my opponents as, you know, someone who is you know, equally skilled or at least as, you know, tuned in the way I'm tuned in. And we're going to discover what the best course of action is for a given situation and just learn more about, you know, we're sort of deciphering the mysteries of the game rather than I'm here to mess your day up. <laughs> the only enemy at my tables is going to be myself. Oh God. I don't even, <laughs> my opponent, <laughs> I don't even know they're doing whatever they do. It's just me. I'm, I'm usually messing up my own game. So that'll be interesting. It's, yeah. it's deep. It's deep. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's what we do on the fifth. Like Trooper, we're in the middle boys. of like an episode of Cosmos <laughs> or something. <laughs> A master class on overthinking yeah. it. Yeah, oh, yeah. If you if you guys want to learn how not to play, come watch me at Vegas. <laughs> well, I think that's going to wrap it up. Um, I I don't know what this week is going to hold for all of us as far as gaming is concerned. I can tell the listeners out there though, you will hear from us in one respect or another. We do have some surprises coming up this week. Uh, that's going to be really fun, and I, I think you guys are going to enjoy. And so um, I hope you tune in, and uh, I'm sure both podcasts will be telling you all about how Vegas went, either while we're there or afterwards. So Sweet. Yeah. Anything else? Any other sign-offs you guys want to go out with? dead silence that's that's, yeah. what really makes, <laughs> that's, 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 that's what really makes a podcast good that's inspiring. <laughs> um, just, uh, you know have fun um, uh, i love my wife i miss my wife i'm sorry this has pulled me away from us for so long but it'll be all of you over soon don't worry famous we'll be together words, again sorry. <laughs> 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 until, until you, season two starts <laughs> until you win an invite right. and then you got to practice for a yeah i know time. until i win an invite <laughs> yeah gosh if uh, if i was only so lucky <laughs> <laughs> all right boys well thank you so much for uh tuning in and uh, i want to thank the scoundrels for coming on and doing this co-cast with us this was amazing and i want to thank evan for uh sitting here and listening to us jabber on about something that he's not going to be involved in 
<laughs> it's so. fine. I bet LVO just makes a Star Wars taste terrible. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, all right, everybody. Well, tune in again. Uh, keep an eye out on both our feeds. Like I said, there's going to be some special stuff coming up while we're at Vegas. Uh, and uh, for those of you that are going to be in the tournament, good luck. Yeah, good luck, guys. May the force be with you. Always. Go Patriots. Oh, oh I'm I'm cutting this. Yeah, part. please cut that. <laughs> oh my god, the Patriots, that's gotta go. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna cut it in and have have Dash say the Patriots, so. Good luck. I'm sure luck. you can I'm I'm sure you can pull him saying something sucks from somewhere earlier in the cast and you just oh, yeah, I mean, together. Maybe maybe oh, not I this can. cast, but but <laughs> yeah. I don't think I used the word sucks this cast. I'm sure I've used it before. Patriots. It sucks.